Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page. And then get immediate feedback against the radical prostatectomy. 300 cases. Track your progress. Earn CME points. Visit mripro.io. We'll take this opportunity to, to get started. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to this first uh, webinar that we're holding uh, for 2021. Um, uh, thanks to mripro.io. Uh, uh, and thank you to all of you who are joining. And I can see uh, a lot of people are still logging on at the moment. Um, from around the world, we've already had a couple of welcomes or hellos from uh, Peru, for example. So we are uh, fairly global at the moment, which is fantastic. And it's just such a terrific to be able to share uh, knowledge and learnings, you know, right across the world using this format. So it's uh, certainly something that COVID has pushed us ahead with. So um, we do notice that these webinars just keep growing. So there's clearly a need for this sort of learning out there. Um, and uh, I know that we've had more than 1300 people uh, register for uh, today's webinar. Um, yeah. Not everybody may be able to actually attend uh, live, but um, it, it is being recorded so that um, if you can't make it now, tell your colleagues um, about it and they can access it on site later on um, so that it's not wasted. Uh, my name is Jeremy Grummet. I'm the co-founder of MI Pro, um, and I'm also a urologist here in Melbourne where we've currently got the Australian Open playing. Um, I actually got to the Open on Thursday with my wife. Uh, just before uh, the new lockdown hit. Uh, so we can't actually attend the tennis anymore, but I, I've got a feeling Ash Barty is coming on the court pretty soon. So uh, we can't afford to go over the one hour tonight. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, that's, so that's COVID life here in Melbourne at the moment. Um, I'm very excited uh, to announce or to introduce, I should say, our panelists for today's session. Uh, we have none other than uh, Professor Yella Barents from uh, Rudbud University Medical Centre in Nijmegen, Netherlands. Yella, thank morning. you so much for joining us Good and evening. for giving up your time on a on a Saturday morning. Um, I'm sure there's no introduction is really required for anyone who's attending this session. Yella is, uh, and I hope you're not offended by me saying this, Yella, one of the grandfathers of uh, prostate MRI. Um, and he's been a tireless campaigner and educator in this space uh, for several years now um, and has got some upcoming uh, workshops, which we'll be coming back to in just a moment um, so that you can get the details, uh, which are online uh, workshops. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a sec. Um, also thrilled to be joined by uh, Dr. Joyce Bomers, um, who works alongside Yella at Rudwood. Joyce, uh, thank you for joining us today as well. Um, also an expert in prostate MRI and, and Joyce, I understand that your interest is very much in the application of imaging in uh, focal therapy for prostate cancer, at least as one of your interests. Is that right? Yeah, that's as well. Yeah. Terrific. Anyway, thank you so much for uh, taking up your time uh, today. We've also got uh, back by popular demand, our usual uh, panelists, uh, Richard O'Sullivan, who's our local expert in prostate MRI. Uh, who actually uh, visited uh, Megan many years ago uh, with Yella and also Andrew Ryan, um, who's our uh, specialist uh, pathologist. Uh, Richard uh, works with healthcare imaging locally and Andrew Ryan's uh, tissue path, um, who offers a, a superb boutique service in, in neuropathology. So thank you guys for joining us. And finally, we have Morgan Pocorny, I should say, back on uh, joining the panel from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, Morgan, again, um, an expert uh, in prostate MRI as a urologist coming in from that perspective and is well renowned for uh, some of the papers that he's co-authored, including uh, with Yella, uh, who's present on the panel today. All right, so um, I've been lucky enough to visit uh, Nijmegen myself. Um, it was back in 2019, which is not that long ago, I guess, and uh, stunning campus uh, there that I was able to have a look around and, and Joyce, thank you for helping to show me around as well. And Yella, I know that you have been uh, organising workshops and running workshops there for, for some time, but now you're shifting them to uh, online or at least in adding online uh, workshops because of you know, obviously the scalability and of course COVID at the moment as well. Um, I'll get up a slide in just a moment, but um, would you like to uh, talk a little bit more about um, the uh, workshops that you've got? Can yes, it's um, it, it's a work workshop workshop for for ah. getting uh, some basic experience with 100 cases, doing it yourself, 
so that you or you are starting to do prostate MRI or you can further uh, advance your skills. Uh, the dates are 25th, 27th of March uh, with the USA time zone. So it's in the afternoon here and in the evening um, and in April 22, 24, which is a European time zone course. Uh, the course is a two days course. It provides a theoretical background uh, webinars uh, of experts, um, including clinical issues, PSMA scans, uh, but it, it zooms in on, on pirates, learning pirates. Then it's a one, one and a half day uh, training with three Tesla prostate MR images. Uh, actually, what, what is, is um, achieved is you log in into the, the Zoom, into the, you, uh, you zoom into the cloud, uh, then your computer or iPad or uh, laptop will become a professional workshop, uh, work, not workshop, um, workstation. Workstation. Uh, workstation. I'm looking for the word workstation. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, then you can just test your skills. Uh, after some initial explanation how it works, but but it is self most of it is self-explaining. Together yeah. with it, you have a, a a digital casebook where you can see clinical data, you can see images, uh, and you can well you, we zoom into images, we identify them, and then you can score. Uh, when you have scored, you can click on answers. You get the answer on how we think the scoring should be, and then we have um, learning objectives. Uh, pathology that shows the answer and also follow-up. Uh, the way we organize it is that you are working with a workstation with our 100 cases. You can do them case by case at your own time. You just advance. You don't have to wait for others. Whenever you have a question, you raise your hand. You will be put into a breakout room with one of our three experts. It can be me, Patrick, or Joyce or Marlouf van der Lees, that's four experts. Uh, and then you have the, the possibility to uniquely, individually talk with the educator. So with, with me, for example, uh, I can take over your workstation. I can see what you do and I can just help you with some questions and you can raise questions. The thing is, it is unique. It's, uh, it's a one-to-one -one person experience nobody else can hear it so it, it is well rather an intimate uh, way of, of of teaching you can ask stupid questions by the way there are no stupid questions but uh, you can ask any question to the expert so this is your opportunity to be yeah. in connection when you're ready you are put out of the, the breakout room and the next one can enter and that's how this this session uh, ad advances so instead of us walking around you yep. are sitting at your desk. I, I'm sitting at my desk at home and very uh, 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 at our, uh, uh, well, at our ease, we can yes. dis discuss. And, and then it will be ended by a general discussion where we can um, talk with the entire audience uh, mm -hmm. through a webinar uh, uh, and, and we can answer some important questions. And that's okay. the way it's organized completely well, at your home. Yeah, it sounds it sounds absolutely fantastic, Yellow. Um, so, I mean, congratulations on on uh, organising it. Um, uh, can you see uh, the details on the screen there? Because I want to make sure that our attendees can can see the details. Just yeah, remember the remember the, the the website. It's www.prostatemri.org, and and there you can find all the information. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks for, for uh, letting everybody know about that, Yellow. That sounds fantastic. Yes. I think I'll just stop sharing that, that information now and go back to ourselves. But I mean, what this highlights and, and why we're doing these webinars, um, why you do the workshops, um, is, is the fact that prostate MRI is not straightforward. It's, it can be quite challenging and nuanced and requires you know, a, a really solid level of uh, commitment in terms of learning. And I think the sort of workshops that you're running are fantastic. Um, and of course, other people are, are doing similar things uh, in various places around the world. Um, but I think equally important as well is, is the, this concept of practicing as well. And so you've got it, but you've got to get the knowledge and the principles um, in place first. Uh, and that's where I think your workshops would be brilliant for that. Um, and I think what we've tried to do with MRI Pro is complement those sorts of um, interactive workshops with 
just a, a large body of, of cases um, and that we've got the 300 on MRI Pro to allow people once they've got those initial principles and skills um, to then practice them so that you know you're, you're practicing online on on cases that have actually occurred but rather than practicing on real live prospective patients because that's the only alternative if you don't have a whole lot of cases to practice on so I think the combination of those two sorts of learning and and of course we also run you know multi multidisciplinary cancer meetings as you would in um, in Radboud we do it here uh, and, I, and I would strongly recommend to everybody listening that um, you know if you're early in your practice that having those meetings specifically for feedback used using pathology to work out where the MRI has gone right or wrong is um, extremely useful. Um, we're going to get onto the cases in just a moment, but just a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, as usual, just so that people know what the format is, we'll be discussing four cases today if we get to four, um, depending on time. Um, and, you know, we'll just be using those cases to illustrate points along the way. Um, I'll introduce the clinical scenario. Richard um, will uh, show us through the images and we'll do it nice and slowly so people can, can see what we're talking about. Uh, and then Andrew will kindly uh, show us the beautiful pathology uh, images that we've got. Um, now, there is a chat function, um, which uh, some of you are already using, which is fantastic. Um, now, we've got very large numbers. We've got more than 500 uh, participants active at the moment. So obviously, there's a bit of a challenge in terms of fielding uh, questions and answers. However, um, if you do have some burning question that you think is highly relevant to what we're talking about, please at least type it in and we'll um, see if we can uh, address that. And Morgan's kindly going to be sort of looking through that and having a bit of a read. As I mentioned briefly before, um, we always record these sessions so that if you do happen to miss out, please tell your colleagues about it and they can still catch it online um, in the recordings on the, uh, on the website. So let's get on with the cases. Um, uh, we have a, first of all, Richard, uh, if you're happy to start loading up the images, we have a 68 year old man um, who presented with a substantially elevated PSA of 13.8. Uh, free to total PSA ratio of 10% um, and a digital rectal examination that felt benign. Um, now, as per current EAU guidelines, um, once the PSA was repeated, the next step was to get prostate MRI as imaging. Um, so I, I just think while Richard's getting the, the images up, you know, it's super important for us to realise that prostate MRI is obviously uh, now part of routine practice in the initial workup work up prior to any biopsy. And that's all the more reason why we all need to be able to learn how to read it properly. So Richard, are you um, happy to- Yeah, I think uh, you should be able to see these ones. Um, the, uh, this, is this is a very busy slide. This is how I look at the workstation. Uh, so we, uh, we scan uh, 3T MRI, uh, body coil only. We do sagittal, axial and coronal T2 images in the bottom left-hand corner. We do axial uh, diffusion imaging. Here's the ADC in the top right hand corner. The high B value, which is calculated at a B value of 1400. And we also do that in the sagittal plane as well, the ADC here and the high B value. And we also um, use a, a dynamic contrast enhancement as well. I, use, I call that the color. This is an interesting case because uh, for, if we look at the, we also do this sequence, which is a T1. T1 space sequence, and uh, we use that to look at the, uh, the bone marrow sensitive sequence. And I only really show this to show you that, that uh, this patient has got a total hip replacement. And mm. even with a total hip replacement, the images are not perfect, but they're still very high quality. So yeah. I thought we'd just go through some of the anatomy first of all. This is this is a prostate volume is only 25 cc. So with a PSA of 13.8, uh, uh, Jeremy, we want to talk a little bit about PSA density and the importance of that. Yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, that's perfect. I was just going to say, Richard, the way you're doing it there with um, enlarging the, uh, the the images that you want to talk about is fantastic. So PSA density, uh, just briefly, because we can come back to it later on, but uh, it's it's probably of most um, uh, relevance in an, a patient with a negative MRI, and we'll, we'll come back to what this MRI is going to show in just a moment. But um, one thing that the data is clearly showing is that if you've got a high PSA density, particularly if it's greater than twenty percent. Um, even though the MRI may be uh, reported as negative, um, the first thing to do is think again and have another look at the MRI. There might be something that you've missed. And even if you can't see anything, then um, uh, often it'll still be worthwhile doing a biopsy. However, um, you can, by, by the same token, in, in the reverse, 
if your PSA density is very low, for example, less than 0.1, and you've got a negative MRI, then um, we certainly in our practice would, would not be biopsying that person unless there was some other risk factor at play, but uh, routinely we would not be proceeding to a biopsy. And, that, and that's obviously, as Yellow will tell us, is one of the massive advantages of MRI when it's reported accurately, um, particularly for the negative ones, is that uh, patients can avoid an unnecessary invasive biopsy. So these are the sagittal T2A images. Just a couple of things I want to point out. The normal seminal vesicles uh, should be bright on a sagittal, a sagittal T2A image with a black margin, transition zone, anteriorly, peripheral zone, posteriorly. And the anterior fibrous stroma is quite variable in its size and extent. If we look here on the axials, we'll go from the base towards the apex. Uh, transition. This is probably central zone here. Uh, tr transition zone, peripheral zone, as we go from base to apex. Uh, the anterior fibrous stroma is this black line here, which is very variable, sometimes very extensive and sometimes quite small like it is here in this patient. And these, this here is the periprostatic venous plexus, which uh, is also quite variable in size. The best place to see the, uh, the seminal vesicles, I think, is probably in the sagittal images. These are the sagittal T2 images, where we see these multi-loculated fluids intensity uh, collections that go down to an apex of a point to the base of the prostate bilaterally and symmetrically. They should be white centrally. Uh, so let's just have a look at this actual T2 image here. Um, in the transition zone, we should, we should have uh, organized chaos. So there should be some black bits and some white bits that are heterogeneous is the really key concept, I think, in the transition zone with well-defined margins. As we go down more inferiorly in this patient, though, you can see there's this homogeneous area of decreased intensity on the, in the transition zone bilaterally, more marked on the right than the left. And it goes really from the base to the apex, or at least to the mid-prostate. If we look at that same area on the ADC, so this is the ADC. Again, this is the artifact we get from the total hip replacement. But you can see this ADC here is dark on the ADC. And if we go to the high B value next to that, you can see that it's bright on the high B value here. It can be quite difficult. I find the sagittal imaging very useful. So we can see here, this is the sagittal, uh, low ADC on the sagittal T, uh, ADC and becomes high, bright on the high B value. This extends over about just over two centimetres. So it's a PIRADS-5 lesion. Uh, it's not the, the, the focal enhancement is not that obvious on the DCE, but if we pull up the subtracted image, you can see that area. We can see the two corresponds to the homogeneous decreasing intensity here that does enhance following contrast. This lesion abuts the capsule over about two, just over two centimetres. So I can't see any extra capsule extension, but I would be concerned that there may be subtle extra capsule extensions. So also I think because it's bulging, I guess. What's that, Joyce? Also because it's bulging. Yep. You can see the, the tumor bulging okay. ventrally. So that's also one of the uh, yep. correctives for uh, extra uh, capsule extension. And it crosses the midline on uh, both sides. So I think there's a pyrrhus. Also, also, also its location is quite typical. It's anterior uh, in the transition zone usually uh, in the mid part to the base where it is sometimes invading the the bladder wall the base the the, the apex of the bladder wall so this is a very typical location of a transition zone cancer mm. uh, yellow and joyce richard mentioned the use of uh, sagittal images as well what are your joyce what are your thoughts on that um do you use to... them routinely uh, yes I I, uh, I prefer to look to, at the tumor or at the prostate in all three, three different directions because sometimes you see something on the coronal imaging what catches your eye which you didn't see on the on the actual images for example mm -hmm. um, and like Jelle said those types of tumors uh, what you see in a transition zone sometimes grow into uh, the bladder uh, wall and the bladder neck and I prefer to look at that at the uh, at the sagittal images. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best uh, view to see that. Yep. Yes, uh, we, we did uh, with a study, our 4M study in, in 600 patients, where we evaluated looking at only one plane, the axial plane only, and uh, have the additional use, I'm, I'm talking about T2-weighted images, uh, additional two T2-weighted images with the axial. And it, it showed that 
especially the recognition where a lesion was, is it transition zone or is it peripheral zone, is quite helpful when using the other two planes. Yeah. And that is crucial because if you have a lesion which is showing no diffusion abnormalities, but a, a, a raised charcoal on anatomy, and when it's in the transition zone, it's a four or a five. However, when it's in the peripheral zone, as diffusion is normal, it's a two or a one. So uh, recognition of where am I of the lesion is very important. And for that, I use preferably at least two or three planes. Now, mm. this is something I learned today is that when you have artifacts for the diffusion weighted image, you can consider in using uh, the sagittal uh, image because that sometimes may be helpful um, uh, when you have a, 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 a distortion. Uh, we do not routinely use the axial diffusion because it's taking too much time. It's taking another eight minutes and uh, we want to end the examination within half an hour. So we use the axial diffusion weighted images only. But, but I see your point. Another thing which I recognize on these images is that looking at the high B value images. So that is the image on diffusion where the lesion is bright, should be white. There the windowing and centering is very important. Um, with this window and centering, you hardly can recognize the lesion, but if you adjust it a little bit, then you can highlight the lesion. Um, however, when you have distortion artifacts, susceptibility artifacts, that is in this case very difficult. Mm. So, so this patient, as Richard mentioned, also you know has has this right total hip replacement, which um, obviously interferes uh, on all of the images. But the interference seems to be a whole lot worse on the diffusion weighted images, um, which seems to be across the board. Why, why is that? Well, diffusion weighted images uh, are very uh, sensitive to inhomogeneities of the magnetic field. Uh, don't ask me why it is. There's a lot of physics behind it, but it is a fact that whenever there is a distortion of the field and that's caused by metal or, for example, by air in the rectum, that's also a, a, a cause of a lot of art, art, uh, uh, susceptibility artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, so air and metal, they cause a lot of what we call susceptibility artifacts on the diffusion weighted images. Um, the T2-weighted images, uh, they are quite good with a total hip prosthesis. Yes. And the, the, the sequence, which is mostly best with a hip prosthesis or with susceptibility, is the DCE. Yeah. However, tumors in the transition zone, they don't need to enhance, especially the lower Gleason grade, large 3 plus 3 and 3 plus 4 tumors. They mm. don't show enhancement, like I think was the case in, in this patient. You hardly see an abnormal enhancement. Yep. But if you have a peripheral zone tumor with a total hip prosthesis, DCE can be very helpful. Uh, yes. Yellow and Richard, just yeah. a couple of foundational questions from uh, attendees. Uh, can you tell us how you prepare patients oh, yeah. for the MRI to get a good quality image? Can you please repeat uh, the question? Can you? Oh, sorry. Can you tell us how you prepare your patients for the scan so you get good pictures? Joyce, do you want to make a comment or shall I do it? Uh, please go ahead. We, we, we actually, we, we actually, well, the answer is we have a, uh, a, a dedicated uh, technician who is, uh, well, taking care about the quality and the preparation of patients. So whenever we have an, an image which is not good, we send her an email. So that's how I do it. But this is not, of course, the answer. How, how could, should you prepare a patient? Would you say a few words on that, uh, Joyce? Or um, patient, well, they, patient they, preparation? Uh, they are asked to have no sexual intercourse for three days before the MRI. So they have a good feeling of their um, uh, seminal vesicles. That's so they show up very bright on the images. Um, just before the uh, MRI scan, one of our technicians brings in a small tube, uh, so the air will go out of the rectum. So that gives less uh, susceptibility artifacts on the DWI images. Um, and I think that's all. Patients are asked to uh, empty their bladder also before uh, the scan. And I think that's it. So no, uh, no diet restrictions 
or no enemas or nothing like that. And no bascapen or glucagon or anything? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> I've got that. Um, also bascapen or and glucagon. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Glu we get uh, them, we get oh, them both. Sorry. Not we get them both. Yeah. We do it slightly differently. Uh, you can okay. see on the digital T2, the air in the red white, because we actually do give, we bring them in about an hour earlier before the scan, and we do give them microlax enema because air is mm -hmm. such a problem. Yeah. And do you do you think that well, do you, your experience is that is that helpful? Well, as you say, you know, it's a it's a very long test this, and we don't really want to have to bring them mm -hmm. back. <laughs> Uh, and so yeah. our callback no. rate has dropped dramatically, and I think the image quality has also improved. Yeah, so I do think it's worthwhile, yes. And what do and patients think patient, of that? Yeah, because... Uh, we actually say to the urologist to tell them when they book the patients in. So at least then, and when they ring up to book in, we tell them. So they're prepared for it all, all, all that. I also know that Joe Bush, he, he has a, a prostate center in at Atlanta where he's doing only prostate MRIs is he is using a micro enema and he has very good experience with that as well. Um, I had to convince the technicians for one year to put in a small female urine catheter. So that's the tube uh, uh, Joyce was talking about and now they are doing it. So um, after this hurdle, I just want to leave it because also we hardly see any air artifacts however sometimes you have features with air so you can't remove it with a tube and i think an enema will be more helpful in that so it, it's up to you what you do but i think preparation of the rectum uh, is necessary because i think 20 percent of or 15 percent of patients they do have air mm -hmm. in the rectum too much air can i just one, ask one last point on preparation um yeah. When the techs see this patient's got a hip replacement like this, there's two ways you can do diffusion. You can do it to a great echo basis or you can do a spin echo basis. And, and the spin echo base one, which is Siemens calls Resolve, uh, is less sensitive to air. So that's what we've used in this patient. But the problem is it's not, a sensitive, it's not as sensitive for diffusion abnormality, which is why it's not as obvious on this patient as it should be. Right. So it's exactly our experience. We did a small study where we compared the two and we didn't see any advantages of the resolve. Yes, it is causing less susceptibility, but no, it's less sensitive. Also, the ADC values are slightly different and we are using the ADC values in our institution as a cutoff point for what is a significant cancer and what is not, especially in the peripheral zone. So yeah. you have also to take, well, to think about that as well. Just while we're talking about the, the basics of preparation and, uh, and in this patient, obviously he's got a right total hip replacement. Um, I'd be interested to hear of what your thoughts are on just basic contraindications to prostate MRI. Uh, obviously a unilateral total hip replacement is not a contraindication. I mean, we can see the benefit of this patient's MRI staring at us. Um, but what about a bilateral total hip replacement? Is that immediately out? And what about other things like pacemakers, uh, recent coronary stenting, et cetera? Jo Joyce, do you got have any uh, protocols on that? Um, we do not exclude patients with a bilateral hip prothesis. Um, I think you should try to make an MR image and see how it's look, how it's, yeah, how it's, coming out. Um, for pacemakers, it depends on the type of pacemaker, uh, whether a patient is allowed in to go into uh, the MRI uh, scanner. Um, some pacemakers can um, are safe to be scanned in a 1.5 Tesla system. So that's what we do um, with those patients. Um, and the other, what did you ask more? Uh, coronary stenting. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. Do you know Yella? Yes, uh, with coronary stenting, uh, when the stent is in recently, say uh, less than six weeks from the MRI, you should be careful. Uh, probably nothing will happen with the stent, but it, it, it has to be fixed. There has to be some, some, some growth of, of endothelial uh, uh, along the surface of the stent to have a better fixation. And it is, it is, well, it's just feeling it better to wait for six weeks. But after those six weeks, 
it is no problem to have a patient in the uh, in the MRI as the the stents at this moment are not ferromagnetic yeah. so no problem excellent I, I think these are good practical considerations because they you know, they do crop up a lot in real life as, as we refer patients in for prostate MRI also yellow you mentioned mag magnet strength and Joyce as well um, do, do you have yellow any um, over overall comments on magnet strength as to you know what is required to obtain a good enough scan? Yeah, that's a very good question because I, I get this question from many centers, uh, especially uh, when there are right now very good 1.5 Tesla scanners. Mm. Um, and field strength is important, yes. But what's in, also important is the gradient strength. You can have a nice three Tesla scanner with a poor gradient strength which is producing terrible diffusion weighted images. And you can have a, a good 1.5 Tesla scanner, a modern scanner with good gradients, and they produce fairly well 1.5 uh, Tesla images. However, the signal to noise is always a little bit less. And, and I can always, you can challenge me, but most of the time, let me put it that way, I can recognize when it is a 1.5 Tesla scanner because the image is a little bit more grainy. Now, with the most modern scanners, there is no prospective study that shows the advantage of uh, three Tesla versus 1.5 T. Um, but recognizing a little bit more noise, I am a little bit re reluctant um, to use 1.5 Tesla. However, if you don't have anything else, and if you have a modern 1.5 Tesla scanner, yes, it is better to scan patients with such a scanner than don't than not to scan them. Um, one remark, if you are starting to learn prostate MRI, you should have images that are as crispy and clear as possible. So the, the, the starters, they should use high-end three Tesla scanners. When you are an experienced prostate MR reader, I, I think that you could work with a 1.5 Tesla machine, yeah. but then please don't skip the contrast sequence. Use all the sequences that you have. Uh, it, it all comes down to cost. A three Tesla scanner with poor gradient strength is about as expensive as a 1.5 T high-end scanner. So the way to, 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 to see whether you are going to use 1.5 T or, or three is, is to have bring one patient or a volunteer um, and our Siemens GE or Philips to scan it in a three Tesla and a 1.5 T and, and see the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the last remark is sequence optimization. It is important to have a technician that is who, who is dedicated to produce high quality images and, and is knowing what he or she is doing. So um, I think it's also worthwhile in investing money into the chief technician uh, to optimize 1.5 Tesla uh, images. What I see in my country is that in about 60% of cases, the although most of them fulfill about 80% of the Pirates version 2.1 uh, criteria, the, 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 the images are not good and they should be optimized. So 60% of images can be better. And that, yeah. that comes back to a good technician yeah. and a, a radiologist who's looking at image quality. How good is my quality? That, that's the yeah. first question you should ask yourself when you read the prostate MRI. Yeah, terrific. Thank you for that. Now, in the interest of uh, moving on with the cases, Andrew, I might ask you to share your screen um, so that we can have a look at the biopsy because obviously with the lesion that we've just been discussing, um, anterior in the transition zone, uh, that underwent a biopsy. Um, and uh, Andrew, if you'd like yeah, to comment. Yeah, so there's the result. So the target biopsy is presumably from that anterior base or mid to base. And I've got eight cores with high percentage pattern four, grade group three, up to 13 millimeters and a tiny focus of lower grade in the, in the left anterior as well, only one millimeter. 
So just to put this in, thank you, to put this in clinical context, I mean, this central you know, midline anterior tumour is, uh, for, perhaps for the radiologists who are new to this field, um, absolutely a classic one that would have been missed prior to prostate MRI, um, where an elevated PSA would have led to a transrectal biopsy. Uh, most of the biopsy cores would have been focused around the peripheral zone. This one's pretty much smack bang in the anterior uh, part of the transition zone. So in the past, we would have seen patients like this who would have had maybe three sets of biopsies at different occasions as their PSA continued to climb. Um, this, I think, case just, I mean, we haven't obviously seen the full histology yet. We'll come to that shortly, but just shows you the value of MRI um, in it avoiding um, these unnecessary biopsies, which, which can often miss anterior tumours anyway. So um, based on uh, that, um, the patient um, had a PSMA PET. Um, I was going to show that, but um, again, again, in the interest of time and the fact that we're um, obviously we are, uh, sorry, just uh, lost my screen for a moment. Um, that's better. Um, given that we're focusing on MRI, sorry about that. Um, I will skip that and just go to the fact that um, the PSMA PET scan that we did was positive for the primary tumor, but negative for any metastases. Um, as a result of that, uh, I went on and did a radical prostatectomy. Um, Andrew. Uh, yep, so hopefully you're seeing that. This is a pictorial representation of the, the prostatectomy specimen. So I usually just kind of spend uh, 30 seconds just explaining because we're going to see these for the other cases. So I usually just spend 30 seconds explaining how we come to this. Um, so we received the specimen, the, the fresh specimen, it's inked and then cut into serial transverse slices and then the apex and the base are additionally sliced in the parasagittal plane so that we see a, a margin, a complete margin at the base and at the apex. Uh, from there, we report the slides and we mark out tumour. Sorry, these don't correspond. I had, didn't, I had different pictures, but um, we mark out tumour on the slides um, and then from there, we reconstruct by scanning those slides and reconstruct where we've marked that out. And we designate the, the index tumour as orange and all other foci are marked as black. So for this particular case, um, corresponding to the MRI lesion, we've got a large anterior um, index tumour that is extending um, from the upper part of the apex all the way up to the base, just into the base. And I'm glad, Yella, you mentioned before about these um, you know, suspicious lesions in the mid to upper base or upper transition zone and how susceptible you are to getting margins in that area. And we see that a lot, not in this case, thankfully, um, but we do certainly see that breed, you know, that type cancer. Um, so this was, uh, you know, certainly in that, in that hitting zone, but not in this case, no evidence of extra prostatic extension or, um, or positive margin. And the nodes that you took, Jeremy, 13 nodes were negative. Yep. And so just to, thanks, Andrew. So the orange, just to recap, is obviously the tumour and that, that matches pretty well to the MRI, but those black or those areas that are marked out in black, Andrew, are additional... Lower grade um, foci. Yeah, so... Only low grade, right. Yeah, so we've got right and left apex and mid transition and peripheral zone and these foci were three plus three. Yep, yep. And it's known um, that you mostly don't see the small Gleason three plus three uh, back on the MRI. They are very hard to recognize in the peripheral zone if yep. they're so small and if their lesion grade is so low. That's exactly right. And I think that, you know, that's one of the advantages of MRI because the small grade group ones or Gleason sixes is it's really from a clinical perspective is not something that we want uh, to, uh, to pick up. Um, transition zone tumor, this, this transition zone lesion is obviously pretty straightforward to see, but I wanted to focus on TZ uh, lesions on MRI because um, I think generally speaking, they're much trickier for a less experienced uh, reader to determine versus the peripheral zone. We'll, we'll have a look at a peripheral zone tumor later on tonight or uh, today, but um, do you have any tricks or, or, or perhaps I should ask, um, you know, where do you see the inexper inexperienced radiologist go wrong with transition zone? Yellow, what, what would you Well, the, What's a the, common the, 
the biggest problem is is that you see a lesion when there is a partly or total ill-defined border and then you ask yourself what am i and you recognize a grayish area and it, it can be within a nodule when it's within a nodule the chance that it is a malignancy is quite low however when you have a say with a diameter of, of eight millimeters, such an ill-defined lesion, it is very difficult. Um, what I usually do is I zoom in with a high magnification and I look at the internal structure of a lesion. When there is, when is, you zoom in organized chaos, so white dots, black dots, grayish dots, then usually it's PPH. When it's homogeneous, beside the noise that you see, if you zoom in too much, when it's homogeneous, it usually is a cancer. Now, there, there is another other help, that is location, as was indicated before. Posterior, in the transition zone, I hardly see any malignancies. So whenever I'm in doubt in the posterior part, I tend to downgrade it. Um, in the anterior zone, so close to the anterior fiber muscular stroma, I upgrade it. Um, whenever I'm in doubt, I tend to downgrade it uh, because I'm, I'm asking myself, what does it mean if I call you a pirate's fall? That means stick in a needle. Mm -hmm. What does it mean if I incorrectly call you a two? Well, the, the PSA will continue to rise which has been the case already a long time, they usually are not aggressive tumors and they're far away from the capsule. So it is no problem to repeat the MRI after one year when the PSA is going up. And when you see a difference between the MRI, which you made one year ago and, 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 and with a follow-up MRI, when there is a difference, then of course, it's a clear case. So clinically, it is not that much of a problem to downgrade it. So whenever I have a problem, I say this is this is pirates too. Do you also take into uh, account the age and the PSA, PSA and PSA density of those patients when you're in doubt? Uh, I No, with, with age, that is something for the clinician because age doesn't define how, how your biological age is and I, I don't see the patient. Uh, but PSA density, yes, that's a good point. When PSA density is above 0.15, I look again, I look again, I look again, and I tend to, especially when the PSA density is 0 0.20, I tend to call it, well, to upgrade it. Yes, yes. I shouldn't do it, but I tend to do that. It's uh, when I, the PSA density is 0 0.20 or higher, I want to find something. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. R Richard, can you think of any? Um, uh, uh, there's, a couple, there's a couple of tips that I use. I, yeah. I find mm -hmm. that three, the three planes of the T2 very useful. And if there's a, if there's a well-defined black margin on two of those three planes, I think it's a BPH nodule. I find that quite useful. And the other thing that I think, which we might see in the next case is what I call asymmetric restricted diffusion. Uh, so if you've got a home, a, an area you're not sure of, you've got to use all the other sequences around to see how, how much restricted diffusion then you need to go backwards and forwards to help you make that decision. So I think they're both useful to, useful in addition to what uh, Professor Burns has already said. Okay, well, just while we're on that, why don't we go, while uh, we can discuss that further, Richard, but do you want to get up that second case and uh, and show us the imaging for that? And I'll, um, it's, it's actually a very similar clinical presentation. This is a 67-year-old man's uh, case two uh, with a PSA of 15.6. Uh, again, rectal examination benign. Uh, but went on to have this MRI that Richard's going to take us through now. Um, so, uh, again, same setup. It's a, it's a prostate volume 50 cc. So let's go through the actual T2s to start with. Again, going from base to apex. So I think we can agree this part here is organised chaos. There's white dots, black dots, well-defined margins around it. Transition zone centrally, peripheral zone peripherally. But as we go more in field, this is about the mid-prostate, the anterior peripheral zone can have a, can come in via an anterior horn, which is quite variable. This is a much more obvious anterior horn on this patient than it was on the previous patient. So there is this area of homogeneous decreased density involving both the peripheral zone and the transition zone. 
And again, as we go more towards the apex, it's in the, it's in the peripheral zone and in the transition zone. And as we go right to the apex, it goes all the way to the apex with some caps sort of bulging here anteriorly on the right. So if we then go, uh, we then go to look at what that area looks like on the ADC, it's dark on the ADC and very bright on the high B value. So you can appreciate this is a better sequence. It's not compromised by metal suppression. Uh, and it's much more obvious, the lesion much more obvious. And it's also much more obvious on the sagittal high B value as well. Uh, so it tells us more of an extension from base to apex involving the transient zone and peripheral zone. And I find it's also quite useful looking at the bladder base. There's no restricted diffusion in the bladder base. So it's no, there's no bladder base invasion. So this does, again, it abuts the capsule over greater than two centimetres. And there is a bit of a bump, of some capsular bulge here anteriorly at the apex, uh, which I would be concerned about, but I can't see a mass. Again, it's another PIRADS-5 lesion. The seminal vesicles, it's not really relevant in this patient, are normal. Okay, so so Richard, just um, as you're taking us through all of those different series, uh, we've had a, a question in from the audience about how do we measure lesion size? How do you how do you do that? I suspect we might, I might differ from uh, Professor Reeves on this one. Um, what I do, uh, I personally think that MRI underestimates the extent of tumor, and so I look for it in the in the, whatever it's biggest in. And whichever plane and sequence it's biggest in. Whereas pyrad, it's not quite what pyrad says. Pyrads would say it should be in the actual plane. So in this patient, if you measured left to right here, it comes out at 1.5 centimeters. But if you measure here on the sagittal high B value diffusion wave imaging, it comes out at 2.2 centimeters. So it actually changes it from a just a pyrates four to a definite, just a pyrates five to a different. So that's what I do, but it's not strictly correct on pyrates. Yep. Uh, Joyce and Yella, what do you do? Same or different? Joyce? Um, for this lesion, I would measure it on uh, the actual T2. And then um, actually I measured in a left to right dimension and from um, ventral to dorsal. And if I um, hesitate, I also measure it in, on, on the coronal or sagittal for the um, cr uh, craniocaudal um, length. And then what, which of those lengths, do you, I presume you just use the longest dimension to then determine whether it's yes. four or five. Yep. Yes, like a little bit broader than now. I, I, don't, I don't have a mouse, so I cannot point it out, yeah. but a little bit broader than now is uh, in the image. Does that does that measurement alter your clinical? You know, because we we've seen these in the MD, our NDT meetings that it's significant. Well, significantly underestimates usually. So, does giving a measurement actually alter your clinical thing, or do you just wait for your pathology report? Because we don't actually usually measure in millimeters. We don't give a measurement. We try and calculate a volume, or well, a, a lot of places will just give a percentage of the gland involved. Mm. Uh, yeah, for this patient, I guess it doesn't matter um, whether you give it a pilot four or pilot five, you have to biopsy it. So, right. yeah, I, it, yeah, if you measure 30 millimeters and call it a four, or you measure 20 millimeters and call, call it a five, I don't think that matters. Okay, we just. <laughs> just, to, just to sidetrack quickly, we're getting quite a few questions on the B values you use. And uh, using a calculated B1400, or do you scan at B2000 as well? Can you just tell us, Richard and Yellow, what you're doing in your centers? Yellow, what do you, you go first? Uh, yes, uh, we, we are uh, acquiring images, preferably with 3B values, which is a low one, which is not zero, because then you have the vascular phase. It's 50. Then we use 500 as an intermediate, and the highest we acquire is 800, because you want to have SNR. From that, we calculate the B1400. Um, we ask our scanner to do that, so it's provided by the technician, but also software packages can do that. Um, the package which is um, generally available is Osirix, and with Osirix you can calculate any B value, I think up to B5000. Um, 
I personally ask now our technician to provide also a B3000 image, which is a test. I have been doing that now since about half a year. And I see that it is quite useful in transition zone tumors because a cancer is likely to have a very bright B3000 and a hyperplastic nodule is likely to have a slight less bright B3000 signal intensity. So yes, uh, you don't have to acquire the B1400. This is a waste of time, uh, a waste of effort. Uh, as the B1400 or the B3000, you, you calculate has a better signal to noise and it doesn't cost time. And the information is identical. There was a paper in the World Journal of Radiology by Leonardo de Bitancourt about two or three years ago. So this is how we, how we do it. Okay. Richard, any different? Oh, no, I would agree with that. I've just blown this up. You can see this is the ADC, the same. This is the top left-hand corner, B50, 400, 800. We calculate the 1400 from that. Uh, and we have, uh, this is from 2018, so it's a, well, not quite three years old. And for the last 18 months, we've been, we've been directly scanning the B value of 2000 as well, which I would say, I would agree with Professor Burens about its advantage. It helps sometimes. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Now, Richard, you also mentioned uh, extra prosthetic extension and, and uh, Joyce, you referred to this as well. So just in this particular patient, um, how do you, what do you look for um, when you're, when you're well worried about extra prosthetic extension? Richard, what, what is it? Um... Um, I think it's hard. Uh, the, the, the majority of extra capsule extension that we see from the pathologist is measured in the circumferential and radial margins. The majority in the radial margin is, is under a millimetre. So we're not going to see that. So really, it's uh, uh, it's when it's very obvious, the obvious mass or there's obvious capsular irregularity. I think that's easy. Yeah. But it, in this patient, there's a bit of a bulge. The capsule's still intact. Uh, all I can say is that's where it is, and you can plan your surgery based on where it is. It abuts the capsule for a certain mm -hmm. amount of distance, mm -hmm. and the longer it, it abuts the capsule, it's more likely to have extra capsule tension, but it's not definitive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Joyce or Yellow, would you like to add to that? I agree with uh, with Richard. Um, yeah, also bulging is one of the signs of uh, extra prosthetic extension. Uh, the length uh, with with the yeah the, the capsule contact, but in the ventral part of the caps of the prostate, there's no actual capsule, so that's wrong. Uh, yeah, wrong to call it like that. Yeah. Um, invasive behavior. Um, this is. I guess a transition zone tumor, which also grows in the peripheral zone, and, and so it's quite invasive. So it tends to be aggressive. Yeah. Um, so maybe also more prone to uh, show some extra prosthetic extension. Um, yeah, I guess that's it for ventral part. If you look at peripheral zone uh, tumors, so in the back part of the prostate, then uh, you also have um, um, uh, what's it called? Um, the rectal prosthetic angle, if that's, yeah, different on, of, if, if that's asymmetric, then it's also more prone to uh, um, extra capsular extension. And maybe Yella wants to add something more. Yes, I would like to show a slide. Is that possible? Practically. I'm not sure if, if, we're, if, if you've got the share screen option, then you should be able to. Yep. Okay, okay, this is it. So I am going to share this slide. You see the slide and yeah, here you see the, um, the, the paper of Pespani clinical imaging in press. And you see the features. It's capsular contact, capsular disruption, bulging, unsharp margin, irregular contour, periprosthetic fat infiltration and the rectoprosthetic angle obliteration as, as mm. Joyce was talking about. Mm. And you can see the positive predictive value and the prevalence so when you have a obliteration of the rectal prosthetic angle, you can be sure that there's extracapsular disease. Yep. I think this, this is the first step towards uh, not saying yes or no to extracapsular extension, but to say the chance is 50%, 40%, 60%, et cetera, et cetera. I think 
this is the way we, we are going to um, to use it in the future. Okay, terrific. Thank at, you. At this moment, we use a three-step three step scale, so definitely yeah. no extra uh, capsular extension. Uh, definitely uh, yes, uh, extra prosthetic extension, or yeah, maybe. Terrific. Yes, I'm the same. Low, medium, and high, or definitely. Yes. I suppose it's four. Uh, definitely yes, definitely no, and yeah, maybe. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that slide, Yellow. That's terrific. Um, Andrew, you over to show us the biopsy of this patient. Um, sure yeah, I'll steal the. Uh, I'll steal yep. if you just drop the. Yeah, you can just take it over. Uh, I think you have to drop it, Yellow. As in, you have to um, stop sharing. Stop sharing. That's what I did. I think. Usually up the top. I don't see it right now anymore. Let me see. The, what I will do is uh, I will log in and I will log out. I think that's the most effective way to, to stop it. Okay. Okay. Here, oh, no, here there we go. Yes. We're right. yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. You, yep. you got it. You got it. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, so, core biopsies from you've, uh, Jeremy, you've done right posterior lateral sampling. Um, and then the target biopsy with obviously multiple cores from that um, from that target area. And we've got three plus four, um, 20 percent pattern for uh, extensive involvement of eight cores up to 14 millimeters. So thank you, Andrew. I just just use this opportunity to just quickly touch on biopsy um, and technique and so forth. Um, so as Andrew's just showed, obviously there was uh, the majority of the cores were from the target, but, um, the other ones in this occasion, uh, not typically what I would do. Normally, I would also do template cores from a smattering of the rest of the prostate. But in this occasion, um, I felt that the MRI was so obvious um, that I was going to get the information I wanted from the target. And in terms of the right posterior lateral and left posterior lateral, they're really just to sample medial to the neurovascular bundles on both sides um, in case uh, the patient needed uh, radical prostatectomy and, and therefore just helping to rule out whether any other significant disease might be lurking there, although there was no sign of it uh, on the MRI. Um, Morgan, just in terms of, you, you were talking about um, biopsies at the very beginning or, or before we actually started the webinar, um, what would be your typical scenario when you've got a positive MRI, are you getting, are you taking targeted plus template cores or what do you, what do you tend to do? Uh, if if, if the peripheral zone is very clean um, and I'm going to be doing a nurse bow, I'll do similar to what you're doing, take minimal cores or sometimes not at all because if the DRE is normal and the MRI is clean on the peripheral zone, I trust that there'll be no virtually no risk of neurovascular bundle invasion. So I'll do a, you know, a 2A nerve spare on that patient. Yep. yep. And I'll just sample the main anterior tumor. What about uh, in NIMAG and uh, yellow who is doing the biopsies and how? Biopsies are being done by a, a physician assistant uh, who was trained by us and the urologist, uh, and they take all the, all the biopsies, which are fusion biopsies, and all the inbore biopsies is under the supervision of Joyce, uh, and it's, it's they're they're trained. Uh, the technical doctors uh, who do their PhD and they are trained to do this and they do well they have quite an experience in inbore biopsies it's, it's either with a robot or with a non-robot um, and the question of course then is what patients should be inbore and what patients should be done by fusion exactly uh, we discussed that in the multidisciplinary team where Joyce and her team, as well as the uh, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, and the urologist uh, are there. The nurse practitioner uh, is being paid by the urologist, is being educated urolog urologically, uh, and then we take the decision. Usually, uh, tumors that are small and are at areas where they are difficult to, to reach, that's the, the anterior apex or the high posterior uh, uh, anterior part of, 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 a, of a large prostate, we do that in bore. The areas which are a little bit more straightforward, and it's about 60% of all the cases, we do with fusion. However, whenever a fusion biopsy comes back negative in the pilots four and five, 
we ask ourselves, is the image good? Is the diagnosis good? And if they're both good, we re-biopsy those patients in more. And I think that is important. Whenever you have a negative biopsy result on a positive MRI, ask yourself what is wrong. Mm. Um, both the study that, that Morgan did in Australia as our 4M study showed that most of the errors that, that we had, so the missed cases of prostate cancer were not the cases that were not detected, but the cases that were missed with a needle. And therefore, if you are a beginner, I would advise to use what we call focal saturation. Stick in a few needles more around the tumor. We also saw that the, 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 the upgrading by extra cause by systematic biopsy was in the area around the tumor and not on the other side. So I completely agree when there is a clear normal prostate beside one big tumor, you don't have to perform systematic biopsy. Yep. Yep. Very good. All right. Well, so let's look at uh, this patient went on to have a radical prostatectomy. Andrew, could you just show us um, how that compares? We've, we've seen the MRI, obviously. So let's uh, see. Yep. How it so our beautifully curated, uh, curated cases has given us a, a perfect correlation here. So the, the index lesion here is from apex up to the base on that right anterolateral um, quadrant. Uh, as described, um, the suspicion is uh, is played out in the in extra prostatic extension, which we show as yellow on the thing on the uh, the volumetric picture. Um, extra prostatic extension at the anterior apex um, and lower mid, with focal positive margin. Mm. So that extra extra prostatic extension that that is shown there is obviously you know pretty pretty minor, um, and you know be really hard pressed to pick it up on the on the MRI as Richard was saying. So we're, this is we describe it as radial and both radial and linear or circumferential extent, and this is zero point five millimeters. Yeah. Um, so it's just not that's not a radiological lesion that or an MRI lesion, but the eight millimeters is certainly something that is obviously correlating with what Richard's describing. Yep. Yep. I, I think you made a great point there, Andrew, before though about I mean this is the value of holding these multidisciplinary type meetings if or not not only if but especially if you know your pathologist can provide this sort of pictorial um, representation of the prostate because it just makes it so much easier for you to go back and review the MRI and see how well it matches up and, and obviously if you're in the, the learning curve then it doesn't always match up that well so it's a, it's a fantastic way to show when you're right and when you're wrong so um, I can see that time is skipping away from us. So if we can just, if, if uh, people are happy to indulge us for a, a little bit longer, um, we've got case three. Uh, Richard, if you're happy to get that up and I'll introduce that the scenario. This is a 71-year-old um, man. Uh, again, similar PSA, 14.2, but again, rectal examination benign um, and went on to have this, this MRI. So um, please take us through it. Okay. Um so again, prostate volume small, 25 cc, uh, transition zone here, peripheral zone. There's a few different areas that look a bit dark on the peripheral zone, uh, particularly here at the right base, and maybe down towards here at the left apex. Uh, if I put, uh, perhaps I'll try it this way. If I put that, and that, and that together, and if I link those. Can I just say, as a, as a uh, a dumb urologist, the way you've just set it up um, is exactly how I read prostate MRI. Um, they're the three series that I will always use. Uh, and obviously, if I've got any doubts, then I'll, I'll go to, to others and, and review it with my radiologist. But T2, ADC map and high B values is what I personally find most useful. And the high B value, the most useful, I would say. Yep. Uh, so this area that we see at the right base, uh, which we've got measured out just on a centimeter in size, it hardly abuts the capsule at all, but it, it is de decreased signal intensity on ADC and increased signal intensity on high B value as well. So uh, I've got the measured one centimeter, so pyrads four lesion. I would say that had a, a low risk of extra capsule extension. So as we go further down, you can see that we've we're starting to see this second lesion here that's a little bit dark in the posteromedial peripheral zone. 
and a little bit dark on the T T2s and on the ADC, and it gets it gets progressively more dark on the ADC as we go further down. The uh, the sagittal high B I think is actually quite useful. If I go to here, you can see it's actually quite an extensive lesion. Uh, if I put that on the ADC and the C2, you can see that clearly going over a centimetre. So you, I think with prostate MR, I think you need to use everything you've got at your disposal. Uh, and if we look here on, this is the subtracted picture of the DCE. So this is one of the first posts we get. And you can see that first lesion at the top. Uh, I'll, put the, uh, I'll put that there. Uh, the first lesion at the top demonstrates focal contrast enhancement on the early phase. And the second lesion also demonstrates focal contrast enhancement in the early phase. So I think it really increases my degree of confidence. If we look at the fused post-contrast images, uh, we can see here it's very obvious at the left apex, and I think you can see them both. They're both positive. So I think they're both pyruvates fours, each measuring about a centimetre in size, both with a low risk of extra cap extension. And I think the seminal vesicles are uh, normal, as you'd expect in this location. Yellow, any comments on this particular uh, set of images? No, I think it's a, it's, it's a straightforward case of, of two pyres, four lesions without uh, extra capsule extension. Yeah. Um, the way I look at images is, uh, is look at the high B volume at first to look at the bright dots. And when there is no bright dots, I'm happy. Um, if I see a bright dot in the peripheral zone, I look at the T2, I look at contrast in that order. Um, and similar to the transition zone, if I see a bright dot in the transition zone, it can be either BPH or it can be uh, a cancer, but for that I need a T2. So this is the way I look at, at the images and this is the most, I think the most effective way. So, um, yeah, but yeah, like again, Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. even for the transition zone ones, uh, when you're assessing the TZ, you'll, you'll still start by looking at the high B values, even though T2 is the yes. dominant sequence. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. Yes, I, yes, I do, because they are more, lesions are more suspicious on, uh, on the high B value image, because they're bright lesions with a, with a dark background, just like a light bulb in, in, in the night. Yep. Terrific. Joyce, do you differ? You do you, differ, you do it differently because this is a matter of taste. Uh, yes, I uh, actually always okay. start with the uh, actual T two. The scroll that which is uh, which from... is the more uh, work intensive, but perhaps perhaps it's a better way. Maybe. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> but that's how I'm used to do it, and then I check for all the um, suspicious spots which I see on T two. I check the uh, DWI images. So, so the other way around. Yes. Okay, so this patient had both areas biopsied. Um, Andrew, you should have the the result of that. I do. Um, so we have left apex and right base, and we have tumour involving the right base target cause up to 70% pattern for uh, up to 12 millimetres, but we don't have any uh, invasive malignancy. You've got some high-grade pin in that left apex, but no invasive malignancy. Mm. So that's... Interesting, obviously, um, because both you can see that both targets had a substantial number of cores taken. Um, but this patient then went on to have a PSMA PET scan. Now, if I can just, um, I'm going to try and get the PSMA PET scan. But while I'm doing that, um, the questions coming from the audience about Pyrads 2.1 um, versus Pyrads 2.0, um, Yellow uh, and Richard and Joyce, the question is, how much has it changed how you report prostate MRI, that, that change in uh, going to 2.1? Do you find it's made a big difference or not really? For me, it didn't. No, for me, it didn't. I, it's just similar. Uh, actually, what I do not like on 2.1 is the fact that you are allowed to uh, upgrade a Pyrex 2 lesion in the transition zone, so a nodule which is partly marginated, you can upgrade it by diffusion, by B1400. Um, I think doing that, you are upgrading too many BPH nodules. But that's a personal opinion. Yeah, I would agree with that. Absolutely. Mm, interesting. So um, just while we're uh, looking at this patient, um, 
So this patient, and by the way, we're routinely, and I, I know we could get on a whole other topic of staging, but um, given that uh, we're running out of time, um, certainly in our practice and across Melbourne and, and I'm sure many other, uh, other cities in Australia, PSMA PET scanning really has become routine. I know it's not yet um, absolutely uh, designated as uh, official staging in guidelines, but obviously the evidence continues to mount um, and this is what this patient's PS PSMO PET scan looked like. So obviously ignore all the lacrimal and salivary glands and the, um, the organs in the abdomen, which are lighting up. The bladder is obviously containing radio tracer, but um, what I hope you can see here is that there are two very distinct uh, av avid lesions uh, on the PSMO PET within the prostate. And they're in the same locations that have been identified on the MRI, but no sign of uh, disease elsewhere. So uh, on the strength of that, uh, this patient went ahead with a radical prostatectomy. And uh, Andrew, if you could show. Yes, me. so here's his picture. So we've got, uh, I've designated index tumor um, in orange. Here is that right anterior or right base lesion, uh, right peripheral zone, posterior lateral, extending from the mid up to the base. And that's uh, pattern four, high percentage pattern four, up to 70%. It's got quite a number of other foci, including the right peripheral zone in the apex and left peripheral zone. And these other tumor foci are up to three plus four, 30% graded as. So that's why we're probably seeing those. Um, all these other smaller foci, three plus three. So this is why this is another dominant lesion on the MRI, but not what we call index. We have to designate one of them as index. So um, there was some extra prosthetic extension of, of small focal, uh, again, what we discussed last time, 0 0.7 millimetre. And it's over only over a short distance as well of two millimetres, um, but a focal positive margin as well. Mm. So this is an interesting one because, I mean, you've got more than one uh, significant cancer, uh, clearly based on both MRI, PSMA, PET. Uh, the radical prostatectomy is also found that although you know, at the apex there, it's marked as black, um, as Andrew was saying, it's, it's actually still another significant cancer. But for some reason, uh, the biopsy did not uh, actually hit it. So I think, um, I guess, one of my points for this particular case is that we do, uh, and you sort of alluded to this before, Yella, is that, you know, we do still have to maintain suspicion if we've got really solid imaging demonstrating a lesion and our biopsy happens to not show any cancer in that particular lesion, then um, we have to maintain a, a pretty low threshold of um, suspicion that actually the biopsy may have missed it um, and the imaging is correct, especially when you've got both modalities, MRI and PSMA PET uh, mm -hmm. showing it up and fairly obvious lesions as well. Um, they're not, you know, they weren't pyreds three or, or equivocal. They were, they were pretty obvious. So maybe, Maybe that's sort of an argument, um, perhaps yellow for an in-bore biopsy, perhaps in the in the more in the smaller, more more tricky lesion. What I'm also curious after was there any difference in ADC values for both lesions? So was the lesion uh, in the left apex did it had a higher ADC value as the right. ref as the one in the right base? Uh, I'll tell you. Just... So maybe that would tell you something about the aggressiveness as well. So the ADC at the right base uh, is 800 and the ADC at the left apex is 900. So the okay. index tumor had a lower ADC value. That's what you should, that's what you expect. Mm. And yes. what about, can you, can you go, go back to the images? There was a fairly large lesion in the transition zone. Uh, in retrospect, can you can you see it? I, I don't think so. Let's just I'll link these again. Um, that's the nice thing about histopathology. If you have hormone section histopathology and you see lesions on the histopathology uh, cancers, which you did not find prospectively mm -hmm. on imaging, we always go back and we have a look and uh, why did I yeah. miss that tumor? If it's a three plus three, I, I'm happy because we miss all three plus threes and that's what we should do. I if think these ones, the three plus yeah. three, so you're, you're too sensitive. I certainly think well, that if, a, if, if, a lot if, of those tumor foci were three plus three in the, in the transition zone. Yeah. 
Okay, so yeah. so don't 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 go back if it's too much of a hurdle, and, and please continue. Oh, sorry, I, I, I thought I forgot to sh 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 screen share. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so here we go. Uh, Down towards the apex. Just, um, I'm just trying to link them. It just takes a sec. Lower, mid, and apex. So, so the ADC in the middle, the high B on the left, on the right, I should say. Uh, I'm not sure I can see anything else there. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I think what as as Andrew was saying is that that whilst that uh, left apical lesion is significant, I think the other areas were uh, Gleason six. Is that right, Andrew? That's correct. Yeah. So you don't see them. So, okay. so we can't see them. All right. If if we're happy for one more case, if I can, uh, please let me know if that's not okay. But um, given that we've got such talent uh, on the panel, um, if we can whiz through one final case, Richard, that would be fantastic. Um, different uh, features again. Um, Sixty-eight-year-old man, PSA six point nine. Finally, we have a patient with a rectal exam that is actually positive. So he's got a hard left side uh, on the DRE. Uh, so he went on to have this MRI, which Richard's about to show. Case four, Richard. Okay, so let's have a look at the axial T2s. Uh, base to apex, you can see there's a focal area of decreased tensity in the postromedial and postrolateral peripheral zone of the left base. This, I think we won't argue about this one. This is definite extra capsule extension. There's a clear extra capsular mass loss of the recto prostatic angle, uh, and it continues at least to the mid prostate. As we get to the apex, it's uh, gone. If I just, I'll link those three again, like we did a moment ago. Uh, so if we get, if we go from base, you can see uh, this is the lesion here with the obvious extra capital extension, decreasing intensity on ADC, increase on high B value, uh, and gets more and more and more. It's actually quite extensive. It's much more extensive more anteriorly towards the apex than you appreciate on the T2s. Uh, and it's the same on the uh, sagittal uh, high B value. If we look, you can see uh, it's very extensive on the high B value from base to apex. Uh, definite extra capture extension. The other thing I'd like to say is if we look here, this is the seminal vesicle here. Uh, we go to the coronal T2s. Uh, you can see there's direct extension from this tumor into the left seminal vesicle. And the other advantage I think of the sagittal diffusion is we can see there's focal restricted diffusion going into the left seminal vesicle. Mm. Uh, and if we look at the color, it's not as obvious on the color. There is there is some enhancement in the left apex, but it does go into the left seminal vesicle. So I think there's extra capital tension, seminal vesicle invasion in this pyrus five lesion. I've got it measured out to two point five centimeters. Uh, Yellow and Richard, we had a question earlier about central zone tumors. Do you report them more like a T zone tumor and um, weigh the T two higher, or do you rely more on the ADC and DY? I guess this case uh, falls into that slightly. Yes, yes, yes. Well, actually, tumors that originate from the central zone are, are, are very rare. Mm. Usually, it is a tumor that is extending from the top of the peripheral zone into the central zone. Uh, and, and when it originates from the peripheral zone, of course, you should read it like a peripheral zone tumor. But central zone itself, based on, on origination, you should read as if you have a really an isolated central zone tumor, <clears throat> you should read it as a transition zone tumor. So okay. look at anatomy, but, but well, those tumors can be pretty tricky because the signal of the central, central zone usually already is on T2 dark. And is it mm. homogeneous or not? This is very difficult. Mm. Um, also with uh, diffusion, the central zone usually show up bright at the P1400 image. And I'm, I'm looking also at symmetry. <clears throat> Sometimes the area on one side is 
a more bright, a larger bright area, and, and then it's a tumor. So I'm, I'm using all my skills. And, and also when it enhances have... is important. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, because that's a very good point, not... Joyce. Central zone. Yeah, when it enhances no... them, it's more suspicious, at yes. least in my Cent... experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Central zone usually does not enhance. Yeah. So when it does, be aware. Be aware. <laughs> Yes. Most of the time, I think the central zone is a trick because it, it, it's, it's restricted diffusion in a place you're not expecting it to be. So it's, a, it's not it's not you. Most of the time, it's asymmetric. They can be quite asymmetric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It also depends on the plane, whether your plane is well, axial or a little bit angulated axial. Then you also see an asymmetry. Asymmetry you quite frequently recognize. And I say from a histological perspective, by the time we start seeing people's prostates after the age of 60 or these kind of things, the central zone ain't, doesn't look like a 20-year-old central zone either. It's not a pure anatomical uh, demonstration. There's usually lots of fibrous scarring. It's very difficult. I obviously see it right, well on radiology at times, but um, it's not a thing that we really uh, go chasing either. So you, Jeremy will have this experience. We describe peripheral zone and transition zone. We don't, you know, we very very rarely will we have a tumor limited to that area that we know anatomically should be the central zone mm -hmm. so can you show well, us can be quite useful this is clearly asymmetric the tumor here is much much bigger than the other side yep. yes yes yeah yep. andrew have you got the yep. biopsy on that? yep uh so there we go so they're uh, non-target biopsies you've got you've you've done a smattering of non-target biopsies um, and they were benign and this uh, the tumors involving multiple cores six cores up um, four plus five up to 16 millimeters so a high grade tumor yep so again on, on having such a, an obvious uh, fairly large lesion uh, with the target uh, only took a small number of the uh, non-targeted cores um, this patient again went on to have a PSMA PET which was positive for the primary but negative for metastases um, and Andrew, just while you're getting the, the radical prostate up um, yep. and yellow, I, I know we're limited for time, but um, you mentioned recently on Twitter um, the, this uh, option of nano MRI for staging and, and found that it was, it appeared to be far more uh, sensitive than PSMA PET. Did you, did you want to make any comments about that? Yes, yes, there are. There's, there's one recently published paper. Uh, by Marlene Schelham, um, uh, and there was an old paper by Ansje Fortuyn uh, that showed that you can detect smaller lymph nodes, positive lymph nodes, uh, with nano MRI compared to the old paper was codeine PET CT and now it's PSMA. Uh, we very soon will submit a paper where we have histopathologic proof, um, and with histopathology. Um, mm. Of the 10 positive nodes in between two and four millimeters, two were positive on the PSMA scan and eight were positive on the nano MRI. Mm. Whereas the specificity was high in both techniques, equally high. Interesting. Uh, so, my observations, uh, supported by the three papers, indicate that with nano MRI, we can detect lymph nodes that are two to four millimeters. Then of course, the next question will be, what is the clinical relevance? Well, there was a recent paper that appeared in, in GCO where it has shown that if you do pelvic radiation plus prostate radiation in high risk patients versus prostate radiation only, you see, in, and they were all N zeros on imaging then you still see that after four or five years that the patients who did not have pelvic radiation, so no radiation on the lymph nodes, they developed more recurrences than the other group. Mm -hmm. So yes, the small yeah, N0 so on conventional imaging lymph nodes, but positive on nano MRI, they do matter. But it may take a while before they appear. Yeah. Um, in more than 60% of our recurrences, we found that the nodes were left be behind and that there, that there were small lymph nodes that progressed into larger lymph nodes. So yes, it, it does matter. And yes, it is helpful. Um, however, it will take about one and a half to two years before mm -hmm. the, um, the nano MRI is approved. 
Uh, and un unfortunately, more and more urologists are, are not performing lymphadenectomy anymore. So uh, we have a lack of gold standard. Mm. That's also and what we saw in Australia. Yeah. And, and tell me, Yellow, just briefly, what is nano MRI? Nano MRI is a technique, an anatomical technique that uses uh, the activity of macrophages. You inject very small iron oxide particles. They are being taken up by the macrophages that go to normal lymph nodes. And after 24 hours, normal lymph nodes are full with macrophages with iron. And iron on MRI is black. Whenever you have an area which is not black, which is white, then it is an area where there is a lack of macrophages. And based on the distribution, on the anatomic distribution, you can say, okay, these are tiny metastases. Hmm. So instead of white, white, it is white metastases, black normal lymph nodes. Hmm. And you can make the background also black. So you, you're looking at the stars at the, at, at, at the sky and then all the stars that are normal, they fade away and hmm. you only see the bad guys. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, obviously a space to be watching. Um, yep. Back to this case, Andrew, and uh, if you could just take us through the prostitute. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a really good one because it's an excellent correlation from a size perspective as well. And as I said on the uh, biopsies, there's four plus five tumour. There was a question before that we answered um, about uh, why do we underestimate? And I, we, we gave a, an answer on the... On the um, on the Q and A, mm -hmm. that I describe it as a trickle effect in these lower grade tumors. That the periphery of the tumor, the the concentration of tumor cells will decrease, and therefore you're probably underestimating the periphery. But with these high grade tumors, they're dense all the way around, and so I think that's why you're getting a really good correlation with what the MRI showed and what we're seeing on the picture here, including the seminal vesicle involvement and the extra prosthetic extension, then a lower grade tumor down on the right apex that wasn't we didn't see. But this is a four plus three. Tertiary pattern five, there's some complexities, uh, complexities but with um, pathological descriptions of biopsies versus radical, mm. but the tertiary pattern five will have been the reason why there was a four plus five in the core biopsies. There will still have probably, you know, that, that certainly correlates, you know, we, in the biopsies we describe the first and worst is the, is the term that we have. So that pattern five will have upgraded to four plus five, but this is still still correlates well from a pathological perspective. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, and especially, I mean, we saw beautifully, and I thought the sagittal ones, Richard, that you showed us before, uh, most beautifully demonstrated the, the left seminal vesicle involvement there. Um, uh, any comments, Yellow, on seminal vesicle involvement that haven't already been made with regard to this case? No, with seminal vesicle involvement, I look at the T2 first, and sometimes you see asymmetry, and that is that can be normal. So uh, I, I'd, I'd rather not call that positive uh, unless it is a tumor which is, is infiltrating. So uh, based on anatomy into the seminal vesicle. Uh, yeah. However, if you see enhancement or asymmetric enhancement at the area where you see a T2 weighted abnormality and or diffusion abnormality, then, then it is positive. So yeah. uh, in the same paper where to which I um, showed you the, uh, the link, um, yes. you can find also infiltration of seminal vesicles. Mm. Terrific. All right. Well, um, I'd like to uh, wrap up now. We've gone way over time, so I'm, I'm uh, even more appreciative <laughs> of uh, all the panellists' contributions today, um, particularly, obviously, uh, Professor Yella Burrance um, and Dr. Joyce Bomers. Um, thank you both so much for joining us. Just to recap um, on the upcoming uh, virtual hands-on uh, workshop that Yellow and Joyce are running. Uh, hopefully you can see the details on screen there. Um, and no doubt that will be a fantastic uh, course for people uh, learning to uh, get all the, the required knowledge and uh, principles and skills to um, be, start to become proficient in reading prostate MRI. Um, so I'd strongly encourage everyone to have a look at that and, and also perhaps following that to have a look at MRI Pro to then practice those newly found and learnt skills um, to really get solid um, before you actually start reporting real patients MRIs. Um, so thanks again, everybody, um, for taking uh, an hour and a half of your weekend. Um, I hope 
uh, that it's been, you've found it very useful uh, to all the attendees uh, who've, who've come from more than 80 countries across the, the world. So please remember that, um, you know, if you have missed it, you can go back to it, uh, even if you've watched it yourself, but you want to go back and uh, revise some of the points that have been raised. Uh, we'll be getting uh, a recording up on the mripro.io website um, in the next week. And uh, if we if you, we speak a little bit too slowly for you, you can speed us up um, and uh, hear us even more efficiently if you wish. Anyway, thanks again, uh, Yella. Um, I'll let you get on with your weekend. Uh, same to you, Joyce. Thank you so much. Um, and Richard, Andrew and Morgan, again, thanks as always for your fantastic contributions. Thanks a lot, everybody.